everybody. Welcome to sunny California. My name is Thomas P. Corwiso, uh, and I'm the author of Good Seeds, a Menominee Indian food memoir. <laughs> I actually knew what it said. Uh, I'm an enrolled Menominee uh, Indian. I guess I should say uh, an enrolled Menominee Native uh, and a member of the Bear Clan. Although I am living in Healdsburg, California, um, I, I still, you know, I still root for the Packers. Um, I'm a lifelong Wisconsin cheesehead. I have a business uh, administration degree from Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas. I also have a bachelor's and a master's degree from the University of Kansas. Uh, I've worked at uh, teaching in the Kansas City area for um, 20 years or so and, and, you know, retiring out here in um, California. The book I wrote, Good Seeds, um, which actually, you know, took uh, a lot longer. It was, it was something that I started as an undergraduate and just kind of kept building a, a, a series of essays, sometimes building on to them, sometimes uh, literally off on some of them. So it wasn't, so it wasn't, uh, you know, a six month, one year, two year project. The good, the uh, food memoir won National Gourmet Award for Historical Recipes and was an international finalist. This was in China. It also won, yeah, China. Uh, it also won recognition from the Midwest Independent Booksellers and the Minerals uh, Miller's Tale blog. What the book is about is uh, stories from Northern Wisconsin, uh, foraging, hunting, and fishing. Um, and, and this isn't strictly from a native perspective, although it is a native narrative. I, th I think the perspective is of anybody living in northern Wisconsin at that time. And by northern Wisconsin, I'm meaning north of Highway 29, you know, from Green Bay to um, Minneapolis, actually. And, and north of that line, that would be the northern one-third of Wisconsin. The book tells uh, how to roast a beaver, uh, partridge egg collecting, and how to avoid bears while picking apples. I'll read a few excerpts on those particular points a little bit later. What I hope the book accomplishes that um, I think there's a real need. We're, we're moving away from uh, where our food is actually produced. And when that happens, it, it, it's not, you know, uh, let, let, let me give you an example. Um, we, we all, you know, every, all of us, I think, know what a pineapple or a coconut uh, is and what it tastes like, right? And, and I'm sure we've all eaten them, but we don't necessarily eat them every day. We eat other things, things that grow around uh, in Wisconsin, you know, we ate corn, potatoes, green bean peas, things like that, things that grew in Wisconsin, not things that grew uh, someplace else. And if we lose touch with those things that grow around us, then we lose touch with our sense of self, our sense of nature, because we as individuals are grounded into this landscape that surrounds us. And I think that if, if, if if I had any success with this book at all, I think that would be it, that would just make people more conscious of the environment and all of the resources that are there that, that we can extract and, and, and we can do it in a fashion that doesn't you know, uh, destroy the environment. Um, this is a tradition, um, it's a memorial to the tradition of Menominee cooking. It's a celebration of Wisconsin diner food. I tell several stories uh, about my grandfather and one of the things that uh, I remember most about him was 
we would travel and we would go to different diners in, in Wausau, Andigo, Green Bay, Shano, in that area. And um, one of his favorites, and as a matter of fact, I think the only thing he ever, the only thing he ever ate and ordered at the diner was a hot roast beef sandwich. He really admired the scoop of potatoes you know, that was formed in a half dome with maybe a little pivot in there to hold some of the brown gravy dripping off the sides. Uh, I'm not sure how good that food was, I mean, as, as a gourmet, but definitely we ate a lot of it and there was a lot of love to that food. And, and we loved going to diners. This book also, I'm told, and, and I didn't really intend on this, but it is kind of, uh, you know, included at no additional price, is that it's a window into indigenous upbringing on the reservation. There is some historical interest. I, I did try to include as much first person stuff as I could, and uh, I've been pretty uh, lucky that I was able to find quite a bit of that. Um, I'm told I should talk about Door County a little bit. I've been there a couple of times at the Write On program, Write On, W-R-I-T-E. Write On Door County. Write On Door County. It's my better half correcting me. Um, and it's a writing community and they do writing workshops there. And um, but I'll also then I have had a long history in Wisconsin. I'm an old man, um, and my family has been, you know, uh, lived in Wisconsin all their lives. And I am old enough to remember being a migrant uh, fruit picker and going to Door County and picking apples and cherries along with my entire family. I am working on a new book. Uh, it's kind of a continuation, and I and I think it's uh, hopefully it's better. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe it's uh, not quite as good. But about being an older child and a teenager on a Menominee reservation, and the impact of grocery stores on Menominee family cooking. Uh, excuse me, just one moment, please. Sorry. Yeah got the sniffles like everybody else does. I'm going to read a few excerpts then for you. Uh, things that I think share some of those points I already talked about. And I think the, um, the, the readings will more than make up for my um, incoherent stammering regarding my talking points in the book. My grandparents shared many foods with their northern Wisconsin European settler neighbors. They also perpetrated ancient hunting, gathering, farming, and storage practices from the earliest Algonquin woodland dwellers. Jeannie and Moon Wiso were important link to the food knowledge of the earliest times. They also modeled an integral aspect of indigenous survival adaptation to new conditions. The most basic element of survival is food and the open attitude towards all kinds of food has been an important asset for the Menominee people. My grandmother was the one who made fire every morning. She always used that term making fire even after they had modern conveniences on the Menominee Indian Reservation in Northern Wisconsin. Later, setting the thermostat was also making fire. But when I was really young, we had a wood stove and getting up to make fire was literally getting up to ignite kindling and wood, kindling wood. Their house also had a small propane wall heater in the kitchen with open flames, a true safety hazard, but it helped keep alive the tradition of fire and fire keepers. In late summer, 
Uncle Billy, who was the best shot at squirrels and partridges, would get up and go hunting for small game. The animals were plumper because of late summer fat accumulation. Uncle Buddy and Uncle da Donnie were also good hunters, but they were better at hunting larger game, deer and bear. So it depended on what season it was. Grandma would awaken different family hunters to get food. Whatever any of us brought back was our breakfast or dinner. I developed good aiming to get squirrels with one shot. We did not waste ammunition. My grandmother um, never threw away any food. If after many meals, a bit of leftovers remained, Rocky the dog got it. He was a mutt, Uncle Buddy's great big bird dog. He was black and white and had long hair. He used to go out and fight with all the other dogs and win. He never bit people, but he harmed so many other dogs that he was considered a public danger. The sheriff came over several times to shoot him, but someone in the family would throw themselves between the dog and the sheriff. After many reprieves and table scraps, he finally died of old age. He is buried along the Wolf River along with other family members. Rocky benefited from the bounty of grandma and he played his part in our meals, even though he was not seated at the table. I think that when my grandfather was praying, he was praying not to white people, not to what white people call God or to the great mystery, but to something more elemental perhaps nature. He knew plants, he knew herbs, he knew animals. The great mystery is a way for Indians to affirm what white people call God. Reciprocation defined his outlook because if people abuse nature, they should not expect nature to provide food for the table. People are not at the apex of the food chain. Rather, all living creatures are an expression of God. We have the ability to kill, but we are not in control. We live among other living beings. I don't think he would have thought favorably of factory farming, not because he was afraid of wringing a few chickens' necks to feed the family, but because if an animal had to die, there should be some dignity to that death. Excuse me one more time. Bears and apples would not appear to go together, but they do. We went apple picking at the orchards where the Wolf River washed around the bends and eroded small caves. In the autumn season, bears like to den in those caves because they also like to harvest the nearby apples. When we went apple picking, it didn't matter that bears were around because they did not go after the same kind of apple we wanted. The bear selected fermented apples too rotten for us. The alcohol laden food must have appealed to them because they ate to excess. Drunken bears are not hard to identify. They stagger, they roll on the ground with blissful smiles. They slur their growls. Some of the people from the Department of Natural Resources used to say that the bears ate rotten apples only because of the grubs and other protein in them, but that was not true. They ate fermented apples like we would drink apple beer and they seemed to enjoy themselves until they passed out. We never bothered them. We, I used to, as a small child, I, I wasn't a, a, a picker, but a toddler that uh, my family brought along with us. And we went into the orchards in Door County, uh, apple orchards, cherry orchards, to pick. 
In Door County, all those years, much interaction occurred among ethnicities. The orchard business always put my grandfather on as foreman because he could communicate. Those orchard farmers liked the Mexican workers, but they could not speak English, so the farmers could not use them unless they also hired someone like my grandfather. Here he was another kind of leader. I remember my grandfather did not really speak Spanish, but he knew a few Spanish words and Indian sign language. He liked tamales, so he would go to Mexican homes and buy food to help them financially and also to become friends. He mostly led by example. One year at Reynolds Orchard, a group of Jamaicans hired on as a crew and Reynolds, the owner, made my grandfather their foreman. The Jamaicans smoke, uh, spoke English better than the white people, my grandfather said. But when whites spoke to them, they gave no sign of awareness. So the white people would tell my grandfather what the Jamaicans should do. My grandfather told them, and they did it. Later, we were back home in Kashina, and that crew of Jamaicans came to visit my grandfather. Just a wonderful party of people. I remember voices and foods cooking in the kitchen late into the night. They were on their way home and wanted to come by and visit and see what an Indian reservation was like. Wallace had a tattoo of a hula girl, bare bosomed and wearing a grass skirt on his arm. It was a real He-Man tattoo and naturally I was intrigued. Wallace was in the Merchant Marines when not living with us on a Menominee reservation. He also served in the US Navy. I remember him saying that he served on a destroyer. This was in World War II. When he flexed his arm muscles, he could get that hula girl to dance, really dance with hips shaking and twisting. Sometimes in my mind, I can almost hear tinny Hawaiian music camouflaged among the rustling leaves of the wind, maybe there, but not there. A beaver is not something most people would run across in their daily activities, certainly not in cities and not even in more rural areas like the Menominee Reservation. The beaver is a water loving animal. On the ground, it is vulnerable to predators and the water only a large sturgeon perhaps would eat a beaver. Given the variety of game available in the woods, species, certain species are less attractive than others. Some people like the taste of beaver, but to me it is less desirable, although it does taste better than muskrat or raccoon. Bear, rabbit, and squirrel all taste better. Beaver is similar to bear, but beaver meat is much fatter. Beaver swim all day, but they also float around. That helps them add fatty bulk over muscle. Their teeth are good for chewing wood, but they don't eat solid wood. They cut the logs down with their incisors. The logs float in the water where their beavers, away from land predators, eat the branches and leaves of the tree. The kind of tree they eat flavors the meat, and some trees like cedar add an unpleasant Aim. As a young man in my, um, this was back during the summer of love in um, 1969, um, I, I read Yule Gibbons stalking the wild asparagus. And so I became this um, great naturalist for uh, you know, quite a while, I guess, several years. I decided to use greens after I read Gibbons as a young man, so I started looking for wild foods on the res. I was from that generation. I would rather get organic natural food than homogenized commercialized packaged food. People still talk about my daughter's mother on the Menominee Reservation because she knew more about the use of natural plants than anyone else. That knowledge was almost lost. 
the rapidly rising diabetes rate is directly attributable to diet. We know for sure that in the 1970s and 80s, but we suspected health and food went together. And one more short passage. And this is kind of relevant to me because uh, one of the reasons that we live out here on the West Coast is uh, because, uh, and, and this is Sonoma County, uh, by the way, and uh, which is the center of wine country in, in California. And uh, we're, uh, our son has a wine business, so the family business is wine. I mean, I have nothing to do with the production. I'm more in the, uh, the tasting department. People still talk about Uncle Buddy on the Menominee Res. One of the stories begins one spring when he brought six new garbage cans Nobody would buy something new in those cash poor days just to store trash. People waited for the garbage cans to fit into a larger purpose. On the res, everybody considered Buddy a leader, smart, brave, loyal, educated. He was a flawed hero of World War II who returned from his last tour in Korea with a memory problem. He could not get the forget the horrors of the white man's war. I was a teenage nephew, the oldest of the pack of nieces and nephews that Buddy babysat that summer. He ran a daycare before the word was invented. He was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin on the GI Bill, and he took the summer off. His favorite wife had just left him. When he was truly in his cups and that self-pitying state of a truly drunk man, he would tell me that Aunt Barbara was his one true love. He seldom got this intoxicated as he had his maintenance level worked out by then. He never lacked for female company, but two or three times he descended, into, down, descended the stairs into that sub-basement level drunkenness to weep about Barbara. The other women kept trying to fix him up, but Barbara simply would not put up with him and left. I was also a college student. I had been kicked out of the local school district, but according to Wisconsin law, I had to be in school. So at 16, I graced the steps of the Stevens Point campus on occasion, and I enjoyed the college social life. At the end of the semester, I went home to the reservation and took up residence with the other outcast, including Uncle Buddy, my mother's oldest brother. In Menominee tradition, the maternal uncle is father. Uncle knew he had a responsibility to the children at his, as their oldest uncle, but he also knew how to turn situations to his advantage. Little kids never get tired of picking and eating blackberries, over the next few weeks, the nieces and nephews trailed into the woods with baskets in hand and returned with mounds of blackberries. As one shiny garbage can was filled and then the next, the children were proud of their accomplishment. On rainy days, they sorted through berries and pulled out stray leaves and thorns. Children needed tasks, but he said he made it a game and they enjoyed themselves while giving their parents time to work at logging, fishing, or catching up and, uh, on gossip. The day came when Buddy decided the fragrant purple mixture in the covered garbage cans is ready to drink. Nephew, it's done, he said. I could see he'd been sampling it already. The sink was filled with dirty dishes and more piled onto the kitchen table. I'm out of glasses, he apologized, but let me pour you a bowl of hooch. He ladled the thick purplish Swedish potent juice into two soup bowls and we carried them carefully, sat down and raised them to our mouths. When that bowl was empty, he chanted more wine, more wine. He had taken a Greek history class and read the Odyssey. So he knew Greeks drank wine from bowls. Well, that's my book, and um, those are some passages that I think illustrate the points that I talked about that I would try to do today.
to those standards. I've also been writing um, and, and have, uh, again, been working on some stories, this one a little bit later on in my life, um, but also some of the stories are directly from my grandfather and I wrote them down as accurately as I can. Um, some of them have already been published in other places and hopefully uh, the whole entire manuscript will get picked up and I'll have a second publication at some point. So uh, thank you so much.